joining us. Um, we are going to get started. It is right about noon. I'm sure we'll have folks kind of in and out joining us as we get going. Um, this is the first of our uh, regular trans health Q&As. Um, today we are joined the uh, Director of Trans Health at Fenway, uh, Julie Thompson. And uh, we are going to get right going. Um, the way that we'll kind of have stuff structured today, uh, we do have some uh, questions that have been submitted to us ahead of time that um, our patient advocate, Noah, is going to be presenting for us. Uh, and if there are folks who are joining us live who would like to ask questions, uh, you are welcome to comment those in the chat. Um, either as a direct message to Noah or as a message to everyone. And if you would like to ask your question uh, live um, with your video and voice or, or either of those, um, we ask that you use the raise hand function, which you can see if you uh, open up the participant window and hover over your own name. Uh, I think with that, we will get started. Um, I will quickly introduce myself as well because I. I'm not positive I did that. My name is Steph Normand. I am the manager of the Trans Health Program, and I use they, them pronouns. Julie, why don't you introduce yourself for a moment as well? Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Thompson. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am one of the providers at Fenway Health and Primary Care, um, and I am the medical director of Trans Health here at Fenway. Awesome. And Noah, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Noah Glick. I use they, them pronouns. I'm the patient advocate of the Trans Health Program, um, and I will be kind of managing the chat here. So if you have questions that you want to submit through the chat, um, I'll be reading those off. And then we also receive some questions ahead of time. So I will be um, reading those off as well at some point. Alrighty, on that note, uh, Noah, why don't you uh, let us know what, your first, what the first question is? It doesn't look like we've gotten any raised hands yet, so let's start there. Sure, um, so let's jump over to one of the first questions, um, which is, how can I affirm my gender while I'm stuck at home? Steph, do you wanna take that question? Sure. Um, yeah, so I think that there is, uh, there is both a lot, and I, I understand the feeling that there's very little that folks can do from home. Um, I think that so much of our uh, gender expression is kind of dependent on what we have accessible and available to us at home, as well as uh, for some people, kind of the interactions that they're getting from other people. Uh, I think that it really is gonna also depend partially on your circumstances. Um, so, uh, you know, for some folks, uh, if you've uh, got clothes that feel particularly great, um, if you have, uh, you know, things like makeup or um, are able to style your hair in ways that, that are really feeling good, um, I think it's important to remember that these things don't have to be for other people or don't have to be for a reason. We can just do uh, nice and affirming things for ourselves. Um, I think that there is also, uh, you know, getting creative and just doing things that feel good for ourselves, uh, even if it is not necessarily something that is, is concretely, uh, you know, gender specific or gender expression specific, but just doing uh, things that are nice and kind to ourselves, even when there are things that we can't necessarily do or can't control right now, um, I think is really important and can kind of contribute to that. Julie, do you have other stuff to add? Yeah, I mean, the only other... Um... The other thing to add would just be to connect to the online community, you know, whether it be through uh, video games or support groups, um, but there's lots of things, um, there's lots of outlets um, that, that are accessible from home, um, especially, you know, just keeping in mind that sometimes home environments are not always safe and affirming, even if, um, you know, even if 
you know, you feel like, oh, I have my own space. But if you're living with folks who, who aren't affirming to your gender, that can be really difficult. Um, so sometimes ways to do that is actually through Peter or other, other sort of sources. So, you know, looking out for, for those. And, you know, actually on Fenway's website, NOAA keeps an ongoing list of uh, virtual resources. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely uh, agree with that. Um, for those of you who haven't been on our website before, uh, fenwayhealth.org slash transhealth, uh, you'll find a link to all of the uh, kind of on ongoing uh, online support groups that we are aware of. Um, and uh, like Julie said, NOAA is kind of regularly updating that, making sure that it stays updated, not only with our resources, but stuff that um, is out in the community as well. Um, and hopefully you're able to find something to, to be helpful there as well. And if anyone here um, who's, who's joining us has any resources they wanna also add to the chat um, or bring up, you know, feel free to do so. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, Noah, why don't we why don't we go to our next question? Uh, just as a reminder to to folks who might just be joining us, if you are interested in asking a question live, um, we do ask that you uh, use the raise hand function if you're looking to to share that via audio and video. Um, and if you are just interested in commenting. Um, you are welcome to send that either to as a message to everyone or as a message directly to Noah, um, who is going to be moderating those questions. So you kind of touched upon the next question, but um, if you want to expand a little bit more, um, the question was, are there any support groups available during quarantine? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I can also actually answer that. I linked the um, Google Doc that you uh, that you referred to in the chat. So um, feel free to check that out. Um, the next question um, is, what do I do if I need to change my medication or my dose during lockdown? Um, and what do I do if I have concerns about my dose during lockdown? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, you know, I think the, hopefully the, the best option will be to contact your medical provider. Um, and I know that all, you know, all facilities are doing things differently. So first off, I'll at least speak for what we're doing here at Fenway. Um, you know, we are up to full capacity in terms of our medical providers, um, though not all in the clinic, but we're all doing um, virtual visits either via telephone or video. Um, and providers, you know, here at Fenway, we recognize that gender affirming care is essential care. And so we're hoping that there's no um, sort of hiccups or delays in care, either, you know, in starting hormone therapy, continuing it, adjusting doses. Um, and so hopefully, you know, in contacting your provider, they will be um, receptive to, you know, talking about what you're experiencing and, and being able to adjust medications. You know, so much of, um, you know, medication adjustment is, is how you feel, right? And I think if there is, um, you know, a concern about dosing or, or your worries and, and we feel like labs are important, um, again, this is essential care um, and, and the labs are open here and the requests around the, the, the state um, that are open for essential visits. And so in most cases, we can probably get that done. Um, now, you know, I think it gets tricky, right? Like if, you're, if your primary care is at a different location and your providers aren't doing telehealth um, and or are not responding or are not flexible in terms of, you know, adjusting dose or starting up on uh, gender affirming hormones um, during this time, um, you know, that, that's really difficult. And, you know, one option is you know, do you temporarily change your care and, you know, come to a place that, that does? Um, are there ways that, you know, resources out there that we can, um, you know, you can ask your provider if they don't feel comfortable, can they reach out to other providers and get a consult? Um, you know, there's lots of resources for providers as well um, in terms of gender affirming care um, so that they can reach out to other resources too. Um, so that's something you can ask your provider if they don't feel comfortable, um, you know, can they look for resources to, to help them feel more comfortable and confident? Um, and you can always reach out to, to Noah um, and Steph um, 
and, and we can kind of help you, you know, and advocate for you in, in ways that we can in terms of at least finding providers or helping you establish care here if that, if that can be helpful or other locations. Yeah, um, and we also, uh, Noah will put our contact information in the chat as well. Um, we also are happy to talk to either you or your medical provider about where to find some of those resources too. Um, you know, we know that it is an area that a lot of providers don't really get a lot of education about when they're in medical school um, or when they're getting their training. So uh, we're happy to either direct folks to resources, um, help them find places to get either specific questions answered or um, kind of broader questions, find trainings, that kind of stuff. We are always happy to, uh, to communicate with providers or to give you some basic stuff that you can hand off to your provider to recommend uh, places that they can get more information if they're looking for it. Um, and thank you, Noah, for, for putting our contact information in there. Uh, like Noah said, or like I said, um, we are uh, always happy to, to chat and uh, get, and that is the best way to get a hold of one of us. Um, I did wanna jump back to the, the support groups for a moment, because I was thinking about uh, some of the interesting conversations that we've been having in the ways that uh, for a lot of people, support groups are actually more accessible right now than they have been in the past. Um, because with a lot of these groups moving to online platforms, um, it doesn't take a, uh, you know, a drive or a train ride or um, sometimes a, a significant amount of travel uh, for folks to, to get to a space that's affirming. Um, I also know that there are a lot of other types of groups um, other than just, uh, you know, trans and uh, gender diverse peer support groups that are available right now. Um, we've been talking to a lot of folks um, either in our support group or, or in other uh, ways about uh, things like groups for uh, parents of trans and gender diverse folks. Um, we also know that uh, a lot of our uh, folks who are in our groups are also regularly attending uh, things like virtual AA meetings, um, whatever it is that is uh, the support that you're needing right now. Um, we are we are kind of trying to, whether it's something that we're posting online or not, we're trying to keep up on those resources um, and are happy to, to try to help you find a, an affirming space to, to get the support you need, whatever that looks like. any questions from the group maybe i'll give it a, a minute um, before i jump in and ask another question yeah um i don't know what the format is i just jumped in um, i'm from cape cod and i already get um most of my care through fenway um but i know a lot of individuals down here who were already struggling with trying to make it work to get their care from fenway um because there are no other options down here for trans knowledgeable care and I didn't know if there's any kind of long term looking to address this gap. Um, if Fenway has any eyes on partnerships down here or if that's something that's being discussed, um, because like you were just saying about support groups, they're more accessible now to those of us down here. But for getting started with new providers and getting in for blood work and things like that, you know, is there a partnership or are they looking at ways to try and make that easier for folks who are not within MBTA range or who have kids at home and don't have the option to come in for an appointment um, because of quarantines and things like that. Um, so that's, I actually am a social science researcher and this was one of the big problems that came out of my thesis that I just hit submit on last night. So I decided I would come in and ask this question. <laughs> cool. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, congrats on submitting your thesis. <laughs> Um, I think, um, you know, that's something we're asked a lot, you know, will Fenway expand? Can Fenway go to other places, especially more remote places? Um, and I think the, the probably very unsatisfying answer is that I wish we could. Um, I don't know. I don't know that we will. You know, I think, and right now is a really tough time to kind of predict the future in terms of, you know, finances and business planning and all that I think has gone out the window. Um, you know, and I think, I think the, the one positive, uh, or hopefully there's more than one, but, but one of the positives that have come out of this is telehealth, right? Is that we're doing so much more, we're doing all pretty much uh, phone and video visits. Um, in my opinion, I think, I think medicine was sort of on the brink of this anyway, and I think this has probably pushed it over the edge. And I think, I suspect that this will become a bigger part of the future of medical care. 
Um, you know, again, I don't want to put any guarantees on that. I have no idea what insurances will will continue to cover, or where where Fenway will go with this. But if if telehealth and and video visits are continued to be covered by insurance, I think that's a really wonderful opportunity um, for folks who are further away um, to access care. You know, it doesn't mean we probably would never want to see you in. I think I think person to person care is a big part of primary care. I mean, for me anyway, I love to see folks in person. Um, but it would cut down on the number of visits. It would just make everything more accessible, more affordable. And so um, that's my hope. And I think um, we see tons of folks from the Cape or South Shore. And so I think that that would be um, cert certainly a big catchment area. Um, you know, that being said, um, you know, we always hope that that people are able to get care in their neighborhoods and in the, in the And so we do do a lot of work um, with community, with health centers um, around. Um, we have done a lot of work with um, health centers on the Cape um, in terms of tra offering trainings. Um, and there are a number of providers down there who we have identified as being being great at, at gender affirming care. Not, not a ton, but there are, there are definitely folks down there. Um, so again, we can kind of help point you in that direction. Um, so that's one thing we're doing, but expanding our practice is like, oof, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that um, I, I definitely have seen a lot of uh, folks talking about the, the increase in accessibility um, not only in, in like distance travel, but also uh, for folks who find it more difficult to leave their homes for, you know, a myriad of reasons. Um, the benefit of telehealth um, is really, really pretty remarkable. And uh, the, the, I definitely agree with Julie that I think the hope is that it's something that we are able to, to continue to do um, when it makes sense. Um, and uh, hopefully is something that that continues to to be accessible and covered um, as we move kind of through and out of uh, pandemic scenarios. Um, I definitely also think that it's it's a, a good idea to kind of highlight the work that the um, that both Julie and I are doing as well uh, as well as others uh, through the National LGBT Health Education Center um, which I know has done some work with folks out in the Cape um, and there's always more work to be done. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we do the best that we can to, to keep track of, of who is and isn't perform, uh, providing what care um, and try to give those uh, referrals as, as necessary and, and as helpful, but um, also very much recognizing that there is still a, a gap in, in accessible resources. Um, we do have a, uh, for, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm not sure if you do, um, we do have a, a peer support group that typically meets in the Barnstable Hyannis area. Um, that uh, you know can can be some of that that peer support end as well, not necessarily medical care, but peer support. Um, that is again currently virtual, but but will hopefully go back to being in person um, in the near ish future. Um, where that is also an option um, and can be a way to both uh, have that peer support, but also network about um, resources and that kind of stuff. Thank you. Um, I, is, is it okay if I reach out to the person whose email is listed there for the Cape Cod group? If for no other reason that I actually used to be a group moderator for parent type life, um, and I would love to try and find out how to get involved, especially right now where I'm stuck on COVID unemployment for the next probably 12 weeks um, and can volunteer, but can't do a whole lot else. Um, and if nothing else, I would, I mean, just from the conversation that you guys have offered up right now, um, I would love to from a self-serving and otherwise way, I would love to connect with you guys on the results of the um, study that I did this past summer, which looked at how adults in Massachusetts are navigating healthcare access. Um, there was a lot of really great stuff about Fenway in that, but there was a lot of really interesting stuff about the areas um, that still exist in terms of gaps in coverage, and a lot of it was coming from the South Shore area. So, and that's all accurate, recent, within the last year narrative data that isn't otherwise available. So, I had already planned on trying to connect with you guys because I would love to talk through some of the results, if nothing else, because um, I think it's valuable. We created a process model and all kinds of stuff. But either way, I wanted to jump into this call to ask specifically about the resources for the Cape. So thank you very much for putting all that in there. I appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Feel free to reach out to Anne, whose email is, is listed there for the Cape group. Um, and then also uh, you can either, you know, just in the same email or, or uh, send a separate email to uh, transhealth at fenwayhealth.org uh, to chat about some of the research stuff. Uh, definitely happy to connect about that. Sounds good.
30 seconds or so. And then if there's no questions from the group, from the folks that are here, I'll go ahead and ask another question. Sounds good. Okay, so uh, Julie, you kind of, oh, we'll go ahead and read off this question first um, from the chat. I went to, I went from Providence, Rhode Island to Michigan at the beginning of this crisis and am separated from my providers. Do you have advice for finding new providers? Um, in my particular case, a therapist and a psychiatrist while in quarantine. So one resource that's um, pretty well respected nationwide is called Rad Remedy. Um, and so that's a really great resource where you can put in um, your state, even sometimes a location within that state um, and the type of provider you're looking for. Um, and they've been uh, providers that are vetted by the community um, as being competent and, and, and great with gender affirming care. So that's one option. Um, another is that if your provider is in Rhode Island or again, if um, another provider who is a WPATH member, we can look at providers who are also WPATH members, assuming that WPATH members are um, competent in trans care. And uh, we can also search by area. Um, and so, you know, it's, that's another kind of way and we can kind of cross reference those searches. Um, so a little bit that you can do and maybe a little bit that your provider can do in looking. Yeah, um, there is also uh, transcaresite.org, um, which is another uh, similarly kind of uh, vetted resource. Um, the, uh, there are less uh, listings on TransCareSite in the Michigan area, I believe, um, but it's definitely still worth checking. Um, one of the other things, uh, particularly for uh, therapists, um, is uh, you can use kind of the uh, broader, uh, the broader research or searching uh, databases like psychologytoday.com. Um, psychologytoday.com in particular has, uh, you are able to sort by uh, quote unquote issues um, and transgender is one of them. Um, the one note that I usually uh, will make on uh, the difference between things like trans care site and uh, rad remedy versus psychology today is that psychology today is the provider themselves saying that this is a, a quote unquote issue that they're comfortable talking about or uh, working with um, as opposed to things like rad remedy and trans care site and a handful of others um, that are uh, either like peer or patient reviewed. Um, so just being aware of kind of the differences and how these are compiled um, is uh, important to know. Um, uh, Nick, yes, you are welcome to offer a, uh, a peer response as well. And that, out, that also brings up a good point too, is if you can identify a um, you know, trans gender, gender diverse support group within the, the Michigan area, they might also be able to um, offer suggestions and, uh, for folks who have been living there for, for a bit of time. Yeah. Yeah, that's similar to um, the suggestion that, that popped up is actually part of the process model I made in my research. And um, if you're in a new geographic area and they have similar to what we have in Boston, like the Queer Exchange, the Queer Mutual Aid in Boston, um, vetting or asking for a starting point in a social media group that is within your identity frame, specifically if you're a person of color, you know, things like that, just to be able to ask like get lists of phone numbers like broad base level, can anybody point me to an organization in this area that I could start with? Mm -hmm. um, and that was actually used 100% of the time in my survey participants. Um, that was how they narrowed down which provider they were ultimately going to connect with first to make that call. And that was like the, it was, it's kind of like, get, it's like checking references before you actually make the call. Even if you start with those websites and then like put out into a social media group in that geographic area, like, hey, I'm thinking about going to so-and-so. Does anybody have positive experiences? Um, or DM me if you think I should go somewhere else. <laughs> um, yeah. But that's been really, really useful for me personally as well. Yeah. Um, some of the other things that kind of came to mind as you were uh, talking to is um, that uh, in kind of the, the, this is more anecdotal than, than necessarily having research behind it, um, but uh, I do know that some folks uh, will also 
uh, find it helpful to, to look online at the like things like uh, P flags even um, or local uh, GSAs, that kind of stuff. If you're able to find really any kind of local website, community, support groups, anything like that, it can be a really great place to start. Um, one of the other things that I've found, again, this is, this is pretty anecdotal, but um, usually the, 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 uh, the particularly affirming uh, therapists are the ones who are most likely to be able to direct you to other resources that other uh, clients of theirs may be aware of or are using. Um, I found therapists uh, to be particularly great resources in helping find uh, either peer and social supports, uh, sometimes in finding medical providers and often in finding psychiatrists too. Um, so I think that it is a lot of it's about kind of getting that initial foothold. Uh, and then uh, a lot of the time people, people know each other and, and the uh, care communities broadly defined, I think tend to be relatively well networked in areas. Um, so I think that once you've, got a, once you've got a foothold, a lot of the time things start to come together. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Is it okay if I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Hi, my name is also Matt Lee, um, a she hers. And I had a question about um, if anybody had like any anecdotal experience around folks trying to gain um, like insurance coverage for electrolysis or like hair removal, probably more for like facial hair removal. Um, I have student health insurance through my school and it took like three months, but I was like able to get some coverage for like laser hair removal in regards to like preparation for bottom surgery. Because theoretically, that is like part of like covered care as a be as a benefit because it's like indirect correlation. Um, but I think right now, coverage for like facial hair removal is generally like kind of like on the edge of like what insurance is willing to cover or not, and it's like not deemed medically necessary right now. Um, and I was just wondering if any of y'all had any like experience with providers or insurances or like ways to get around that. Julie, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, you sort of, you sort of nailed it. I think you have a good, a good understanding of sort of what the insurances are doing and that, um, you know, there, there is, there is coverage for electrolysis, um, that's related to surgery. Um, but unfortunately no insurances within Massachusetts are covering any other, uh, hair removal at other locations. Um, you know, we've actually done a bit of advocacy. There's actually a, a, a group um, in the, well, in the Boston area, but also, but sort of all around Massachusetts um, who have gotten together um, to sort of form like a, a bigger, stronger sort of advocacy group, um, all, you know, providers, therapists, um, um, advocates, managers, everyone who's sort of kind of devoted to this process. And, uh, have lobbied with uh, several insurance companies, including Mass Health, Blue Cross Blue Shield, to really sort of say, you know, facial hair removal is is really necessary. It's essential for for many folks. Um, you know, of course, the face is something you see. Um, unfortunately, as of yet, they have not covered this, um, and so we can we are continuing to fight for that. But um, as of now, Massachusetts, there, which well, because. That's my understanding of it as well. I'm also in Rhode Island, um, just mm -hmm. on the street. Uh, but yeah, like the only way that I figured out um, for like low income folks to pay for it is there's like a, I think it's a point of pride online. There's like an electrolysis support program and they do like maybe three folks a like quarter theoretically. Mm. But I know right now they're putting that program on hold because of the current time. Right. Um, so yeah, cool. Yeah, there yeah. are a couple, there's also a couple of um, electrology schools um, that tend to be cheaper. Really? Um, yeah, I can, I can look for the New name. England or like? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't know if in, Rhode, I don't know Rhode Island, I'm, I'm assuming, but um, there are, there's at least one in Massachusetts. I'm actually sure there's more than one. Um, but, um, so it's students, but they're under the guidance of their, you know, their teachers yeah. or their, um, and so that tends to be a cheaper option. Um, so, um, so you know, if you kind of if you look into that, that that might be another. Sick. If you could put those in the chat, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll try and remember. Or you feel free to send me an email as well, so that I have your contact information and I can um, get back to you with the um, with that information. 
I think that would probably be easiest for now. Um, the only other things that I have to add to all of that, I know, um, you know, it's, it's not ideal options, but I know that some folks uh, pursue crowdfunding um, or uh, things like Groupons sometimes will have electrolysis or laser. Um, you know, none of these are ideal options and are still kind of at a particular, um, you know, economic status that you're going to have to be at to, to, be, to be able to do that. Um, the other kind of advocacy group um, that I have seen doing some work on this is the, uh, the uh, Massachusetts Trans Health Coalition, um, which works with um, a variety of uh, legal advocates as well and kind of um, a different angle on the same issue. Um, and uh, to kind of directly answer the how can regular folks get involved with these kinds of this kind of advocacy, um, I would actually reach out, um, you know, if you're, if you're thinking Massachusetts specific, um, I know that the uh, Massachusetts uh, Trans Political Coalition has been involved in some of that. Um, so reaching out to them directly is probably going to be the easiest way to, to get looped into some of that advocacy. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that that's one of the areas that I know that we've been uh, pushing the hardest to try to get, get more coverage because it is such an essential aspect of um, some people's, you know, gender affirmation process. Uh, and I think that it, it really is just kind of coming down to um, us having enough research on the, uh, the, you know, the essential benefits that it has uh, for us to be able to prove the, um, to the insurance companies that, that it's something that really needs to get covered. And then we also had a question from Nick. Um, how can regular folks get involved with this kind of advocacy? Yeah, yeah, I would say uh, the Massachusetts Trans Political Coalition is probably the, the best way into advocacy, not only around this specific thing, but in general uh, around trans stuff. But uh, Julie, do you have other stuff to add too? The only other thing I would add is that some health centers, if Fenway does, and, and hopefully other health centers and organizations have community advisory boards. Um, and so if you were interested in being a member on one of those boards, um, it's a great time for um, community to kind of weigh in on what's important to them, what's going on in their world, what, are, what, what can the health center organization do that we're not doing already. Um, and so that's a good way to get involved. Yeah. Um, I can jump in and ask another question. Um, I'm suddenly out of my hormones due to COVID-19 and my provider's office is not responding. Is it safe to go off of hormones suddenly and should I be worried? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's a, you know, I think that's a sort of a nuanced question and I think um, in, in most cases, it is safe to go off of hormones, at least for the short term, um, but it doesn't always feel good for multiple reasons, right? I think uh, clearly emotionally, um, it, it can feel pretty terrible. Um, it can also feel pretty terrible physically. You know, some people do get um, sort of withdrawal feelings when they come off their hormones. Um, and then, you know, depending on whether or not someone is able to produce their own sex hormones, um, that can also feel not great, right? Whether um, you can produce your own, what you call endogenous hormones or the hormones that you can produce yourself might not feel great because it's not affirming to your gender. And that will sort of, in most cases, sort of come back up if, you're, if the hormones that you're taking are, are gone. Um, and that can feel pretty bad. Or... If you're unable to, right, if you've had, um, you know, what's called an orchiectomy uh, or um, a hysterectomy with your ovaries removed, then you're not able to produce your own um, sex hormones. Um, and, then, and then you're not, you don't have any sex hormones around. Some people do okay with this, but some people, it makes them feel, um, it can make them, you feel fatigued, low libido, kind of depressed sometimes. And so again, you kind of feel those withdrawal symptoms. Um, in the short term, in terms of like, you know, safety, physical safety and not being on hormones, it's typically okay and safe. Um, extended amounts of time being off all hormones altogether, like talking about a year or two years, it can actually start to impact bone health um, and sort of can put you more at risk for osteopenia or osteoporosis, which is low, low bone density and 
put you more at risk for fractures. Um, and so, you know, hopefully it would never go that long, but that's sort of that long-term risk. Short-term, it's more just kind of feeling a little crummy um, or a lot crummy, you know. Um, and, so, and so that's sort of, that's sort of how, how that would feel. Um, and I will also say one other thing about that. If you've been on hormones for a long period of time, and that's sort of an arbitrary thing to say a long period of time, for some people it can be five years, other people it can be 25 years, but it might take longer for your own body to kind of kick back in and sort of start producing their own sex hormones. So again, it, you know, you might kind of feel in that or no hormone state for, for longer. Um, And I think the other, the other part of that, um, oh, just should you be worried? Well, I mean, I guess it doesn't feel good. So <laughs> I would reach out to someone. Um, and that would be either your provider again and, and really try to, to say, um, you know, try to advocate on how essential it is. Um, again, you can reach out to, to us. Um, you know, we're happy to, as much as we can, um, sort of advocate or turn you in, you know, pull, point you in directions where maybe that care, you can access that care. Thank you, Julie. I'll give it another minute um, if anyone has any questions that they want to jump in and ask, and then um, I can go ahead and ask the next question that I have. All right, I'm an, um, we've got a question. What is the process for someone interested in learning about or starting on hormones via telehealth? So, I mean, again, I can only speak for, for here at Fenway, but our process is, you know, essentially just like as if we were, if you, you were coming into the clinic. So, um, you know, if you're new to Fenway uh, or if you're, even if you're an established patient, you would schedule, um, you would schedule an appointment with a provider uh, for a video or, tele or, or phone visit. Um, and then, you know, talk about what you're interested in, right? Talk about hormones, questions, concerns. Um, you know, the majority of the conversation, especially when we're talking about adults um, and, and sort of getting, you know, uh, starting gender affirming hormone therapy, it is really about talking and sort of understanding your goals, understanding risks and benefits, sort of expectation planning. Um, and so a lot of that can be done pretty easily and seamlessly via um, video or, or, or phone visits. Um, and as Steph had mentioned, you know, sometimes it honestly just makes it easier, right? It's less anxiety provoking, you don't have to drive in. And so a lot of that is easy. Um, you know, it's in terms of labs prior to starting on hormone therapy, for the majority of folks, um, particularly healthy folks, um, they're very limited. And I think in this time of um, coronavirus pandemic, like most things, right, we're being pretty flexible in terms of like, what do we need versus what do we want and what is essential? And so we're, we're mostly deferring um, lots of labs um, or the minimal labs that, that we, we tend to say we need. Um, you know, if, if you do happen to have an underlying health condition or a need to check labs prior to starting, again, this is essential care and we can do those labs. Um, and so that's the conversation you'd have with your provider at the time. So, um, you know, hopefully um, it wouldn't be, you know, again, we're really trying to proceed as usual um, and not have too many backups or hiccups along this process. Yeah. One of the other things that I like to, to mention to folks too, um, who are interested in talking about uh, hormones uh, is that there is no uh, what I've kind of referred to as commitment point where if you schedule an appointment you have to start something. Um, I think that sometimes people just uh, are looking for you know sometimes we, we're talking to people who are like I want to be on hormones three weeks ago let's make this happen. Um, whereas other times there are folks who just want to be able to ask those questions and, and get the most up-to-date and accurate information for their body and in that one-on-one -on -one conversation with a, with a medical provider. Um, and we're able to do to both of those, we're able to do anything in between or outside of that. I, I think that it's, 
uh, our model of care is very intentionally, very individualized. Uh, and we want to talk to each individual person and know what are your goals and how can we best help you to achieve those. Um, we don't have like a, a set path of you have X number of visits and that's when, you know, a medication is put into your body. Like we want people to know uh, that it's, it's individualized and it's what you need. Thank you both. I'll go ahead and ask uh, the next question that I have, um, which is, I'm in lockdown in a different state from my gender affirming care provider. Can I still get my hormones? I think that the answer to that is going to be it depends. Um, it, you know, it depends on if um, your provider can, well, yeah, I mean, I think it depends on a couple of factors. Sorry, I think it depends on if your provider is willing to do that. Um, and again, hopefully, um, your provider would be because, you know, especially if it's ongoing care, um, even if it's initiation, um, you know, so much can be done um, via these telehealth visits. Um, and so, shouldn't put much of a, a glitch in that. Um, and you know, and typically for you know estrogen. Um, medications can be shipped over state lines shouldn't be a problem at all the one um, medication testosterone is considered a controlled substance in many states um, and because of that um, in, in states that it is considered a controlled substance substance um, it can't be prescribed over state lines um, in some cases so that would be the one thing you'd want to talk to your provider about um, and in which case you know again it's sort of figuring out how to how to navigate that um, you know, hopefully during this short time period, whether it's, you know, getting a referral to established care kind of briefly somewhere else um, until this passes um, and, and sort of work through it from there. But sometimes it's that legal aspect that might not have anything to do with, you know, providers desire or morals, but more just sort of legal, legal issues from state to state. I'm gonna give it a few more, a few more seconds, and then I'll jump in and ask uh, another question. And also, just a reminder: um, feel free if you want to use the raise hand feature. Um, we can also, you can also ask questions that way as well. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and ask the next question. I've been seeing some things about estrogen being used as a treatment for COVID. Are we going to have a shortage of estrogen like we did for hydroxychloroquine? I think I pronounced that right. I don't know. <laughs> do you want, Steph, do you want to, do you want to start or? Yeah, I can start with that. Um, I, I mean, I'll start by saying we, we can't know for sure. Um, I, I think that this is still research that is, is just in its infancy um, from what I've been able to tell and we don't really know where things are moving or where things are going. Um, the couple things that I, I can say is that particularly uh, the injectable estrogens that we will sometimes use for gender affirming care um, have shortages anyway. Um, relatively regularly and cyclically. Um, I don't think, Julie, correct me, I don't think that's happened in a bit now, um, but I do know that's something that happens relatively regularly. Um, in the research I've been able to do, it looks like uh, the, the two kind of most, uh, the two things that are being researched right now are um, Premarin, uh, which is a medication that we don't really use quite as much uh, in, or really that we, we recommend using at this point um, for gender affirming care, uh, as well as one of the uh, estrogen patches um, are the two that I've seen being researched for this potential or for this particular uh, potential, you know, uh, care plan. Um, 
And uh, I, I think that, you know, we, if there are shortages, I, I know that we are, we are happy to talk about with our patients. And, and I think that I would hope that other providers would as well uh, be happy to talk about other options to kind of uh, switch over to if needed. Um, but that's kind of what I've seen so far. Um, and I think beyond that, I, I don't know that I have much more, many other answers. I can't really guarantee anything. Um, Julie, do you have other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think just to echo what you're saying, that I think that a lot of a lot of these sort of experimental um, modalities are really, um, you know, it, it's hard to say where they're where they're going right now. A lot of these studies are really small, um, and so I think right now, you know, there's not a huge run on estrogen or um, or um, you know other medications right now. I think these are these are really kind of small pocketed studies, sort of looking at like theories that are kind of coming out with um, the population that they're studying so far. Um, I suspect, you know, if, if um, you know, it'd be great if estrogen were somehow very helpful for this, that would sort of motivate uh, in, um, pharmaceutical companies to produce more, you know, whereas unfortunately they're not uh, for gender affirming care. So, you know, again, I can't say that that's true, but um, I don't think that is the fear that sort of um, that I would kind of ride on right now in terms of being, being an estrogen shortage right now. Um, you know, I think there's lots of theories out there that um, kind of touch on aspects of care uh, for gender affirming folks that I think um, can be concerning, right? I think one of them is um, the use of spironolactone. Like that's come up in a lot of conversations, right? That people are afraid that spironolactone may um, increase their, their likelihood of transmission uh, of, of coronavirus or worsen their course um, based on, you know, dispironolactone, I don't know if you've all heard of this, um, um, upregulator increase this receptor called the ACE2 receptor, which a lot of people are talking about in regards to a blood pressure medication called lisinopril or losartan. Um, you know, there was a, um, a provider, a dermatologist in New York who talked about it in a, I forget what magazine it was, but it sort of um, uh, talked about using spironolactone in uh, folks for acne and how she's going to not do that anymore. And so that really caused a lot of fear um, for gender diverse folks using spironolactone. Um, you know, and that, that was actually based off a 2005 study that was really small and not even looking at the effects of spironolactone in the lungs or on the heart or kidneys, um, but in other cells. So it, essentially it didn't really touch on, on the population. And in fact, the, um, I think it was um, the, um, the dermatological uh, folks, the, the Academy of Dermatology actually said not to stop spironolactone. Um, and, you know, so on the flip side of that, um, now they're thinking, yeah, actually is spironolactone protective? Uh, and again, with this idea that it's an anti-androgen and so, um, same, same kind of idea of why people are using are trying out estrogen, um, that potentially there's some protective factor um, in low androgens or even estrogen. Um, so now apparently there's studies looking at spironolactone being protective. Um, so again, not to spread that either, because again, these are all really experimental, um, but just sort of taking these studies in stride um, and talking to your provider before um, you know, deciding to switch your medic or, you know, if you, if you want to switch your medications or going off stuff, because you might not have to, and it may depend on individual risk. It may depend on sort of the, the studies that are coming out and what we learn day by day these days. Um, but, but try not to kind of let all of these studies sway you day to day, but kind of take it all in stride. Yeah. I think that's really important. Uh, with uh, like consumption of media as well. I think that the way that a lot of these studies are then interpreted and reported on um, is kind of that additional layer of um, confusion for a lot of folks, especially if you don't have access or um, aren't for various reasons, aren't able to read or interpret the actual studies that are happening. Um, it can be really difficult to know what things to and not to listen to or to um, I think that, uh, I mean, I know I've been feeling this myself even, um, I think a lot of people are kind of trying to, for themselves, find a way to get ahead of this and be as protected as possible um, and uh, do everything that they possibly can, even if the research isn't quite there yet. Um, and I think that's why we're seeing rushes on, um, why we saw the, the rush on uh, hydroxychloroquine and why we're having all of these kind of jumps um, ahead of what the research is actually showing yet. 
um, is that people want to be the one that's protected. People want their family and themselves to be safe. And um, I think that's a natural instinct, but I also think that um, it's really hard to know what to and not to listen to with all of the information we're getting that isn't always balanced. But yeah, I think the summary is, is talk to your doctor um, and uh, make the best decisions for you with folks who are, are keeping track of it and, and staying informed as much as possible. I'll go ahead and give it a minute um, if anyone has any questions that they want to jump in and ask. I will also just note we've got about 10 minutes left. So if you've got something you were holding on to, now's a good time to let us know so we don't miss you. I will go ahead and ask the next question, which um, we kind of already touched upon, but it is, um, can I start hormones during COVID? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's um, provider and facility dependent. Um, so speaking from Fenway, yes, um, please do call, please do register as a patient, please ask if that's where, um, if that's what you're interested in. Um, and we are certainly trying to, to do business as usual um, as anyone can in this time. Yeah, I actually kind of on the, the benefits of uh, telehealth and, and stay at home orders and such, I was talking to someone probably around a month ago now um, who was uh, very excited to pursue starting hormones um, and potentially starting while still staying at home because it meant that they could go back to work and have been on hormones for a while at that point and kind of skip out some of the, um, the I'm just starting part, um, which I thought was also a, a, an interesting perspective and a, a cool way to think about stuff. So um, yeah, you know, we, we are happy to, to talk to folks. And if you, if we are not accessible um, for whatever reason, um, you know, you're also still welcome to reach out to us and, and we can do the best that we can to help you find someone in your area. Uh, we don't always have all the information, but we can at least do the best that we can to help you find some resources to get started on. And I think also just to go back to what we were talking about earlier, um, both Rad Remedy and Trans Care Site are um, good places to start if you're looking for um, a hormone provider um, in your area. Um, okay, I have one more question on my list. Um, also, feel free to jump in and ask any last minute questions in the chat um, or using the raise hand feature. Um, but this last question is, my state is opening back up too early in my opinion, but I still have a haircut appointment scheduled to help with my insignificant dysphoria. Is it ethical to get a haircut when your state opens back up, even if you think the state should remain on lockdown for a while longer. Ooh. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say my opinion and then I'd be happy to open it up to, you know, I think it'd be interesting to hear from others. I think, um, look, we all, I think we all have to do the best we can during this time to keep ourselves safe, our, fr our, our families and, and our community, right? And so, part, you know, and so it's always weighing those risks and benefits. And part of keeping ourselves safe is decreasing dysphoria and being okay in the world. And um, sometimes it's not going out, right? And it's sort of weighing that really individually. Um, you know, I think particularly if a state opens up, depending on where you are in the country, risks might be slightly lower. Um, I mean, I would certainly adhere to all of the precautions that are possible, you know, masking or wearing gloves or whatever that, you know, you feel, you know, is safe or, or doing at least that that sort of minimal precaution, um, I think is really important. Um, again, just to, to do our part in this. Um, but, I, but I think if, um, you know, if the location is open, if your state has opened up, um, if this is uh, really important to you, um, you know, I think we have, to, we have to do the things we have to do. Um, and so, you know, I don't think this is a time to judge others. And so I say, you know, I trust that you gotta do it. 
Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I think that um, it is uh, actually in some ways not my place to judge how, uh, how significant not getting a haircut or not doing, you know, whether it's haircut, whether it's, um, you know, we were talking a little bit about laser and electrolysis earlier, if that's one of the, one of the things that really is, is important to you to be doing. Um, I think that it's, uh, it is important to make those decisions uh, for yourself weighing, like Julie said, the risks and benefits. If it's really important to you to, um, to be doing those things right now, then it's important and that's uh, what needs to be happening. Um, and I think that if it is, um, you know, taking into account the, the health of the, the folks that you're around every day um, and, uh, you know, all of the, the risks, like Julie said, uh, doing everything that you can to um, make that as safe of a trip as possible, um, I would say is also important. Um, but not everyone can, can uh, safely sport a uh, quarantine haircut either. Um, so I think it's, it's important to weigh those things uh, and, and do what's right for you. Um, but I, I'll put it this way. I definitely wouldn't say that it is concretely not ethical. Um, and I think that for some people, it, it is something that makes sense to do. Um, and that's something that, that each individual person would have to judge for themselves. Um, alrighty. Any last questions that we've got or are we doing good? I'll go ahead and put um, our contact information in the chat um, just in case um, you'd like that again. And feel free to reach out. Um, oh, it looks like we've actually got one more question. Um, go ahead and either type it in or if you want to um, unmute your microphone and ask it, um, feel free to do that too. I'm going to guess you're typing. So I'm just going to chat for a second um, while you do that. Um, for those of you who are watching this video after the fact, um, we'll also make sure that all of the links that we mentioned um, will be in the description of the video. Um, so definitely feel free to check out there. We'll, we'll have everything linked and, and easy to go. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read the question in the chat. Is it any harder or easier for a younger person who can't yet start hormones to start on puberty blockers? I can't really find anything on it. So I don't, you know, we, we only have two minutes left, so I'm going to try to answer this as quickly as possible. You don't really think it's a matter of difficulty or, or ease. I think it's more of what's right for the individual. Um, you know, puberty blockers are often used at a time um, when someone is starting to go through puberty. Um, so not necessarily um, needing to start on, uh, on sex hormones right away, but sort of um, needing to block the hormones that they have now um, to really kind of figure out well, a couple of things. One, to block the hormones they are now to decrease, they have, they have at the time that they're producing um, to decrease dysphoria. Um, and oftentimes to give themselves and their family uh, a chance to, you know, decide is this the right, is this right for them? Is this the path they want to go down? You know, kind of go through all of that thought process. Because um, when folks are younger, you know, brains work different. And it's good to kind of give time to, to consider that and feel what that feels like. And get the pressure off of puberty during that time to think through it, because that can be really distressing. Um, the other thing too, is that puberty blockers are used, um, again, to kind of stop the, the, the puberty that's happening. Um, and it's not yet time to start on other hormones, right? It's not, you know, with their peers, um, their peers aren't going through puberty necessarily yet either. So again, it, it might not even be the right time to start uh, either, either testosterone or estrogen, but kind of wait until their peers start to, to, to go through puberty and then start. Um, you know, so, so I think there's, there's a specific place for blockers. There are folks who start both at the same time, right? They'll start on um, either estrogen or testosterone and a puberty blocker um, because uh, puberty blockers work really well. They work really well at um, suppressing, um, again, what you call that endogenous system or the, the hormones that you're producing in your body. 
um, and they're partially reversible or they are, they're fully reversible actually, um, not partially, they're fully reversible. So um, if you were to come off of puberty blockers, um, you know, then, then you would go through the puberty that your body would, would head towards anyway. So um, yeah, again, it's sort, of, it's sort of not an ease or difficult thing. It's more just what, what is right for the time um, and the individual. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, it's definitely something that's pretty individualized as well. Um, and uh, if you have kind of specific questions about, uh, you know, a particular person, whether it's yourself or someone else, or circumstances about what that might look like in a little bit of a more concrete sense, definitely feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to talk to you about, um, you know, kind of what we would do at Fenway if you're nearby, um, or, you know, what our general philosophies are around, um, which medications we do and don't pursue at different times and, and kind of a little bit more of an individualized conversation. We're happy to do that as well. Yeah. All righty. Um, I think on that note, we are going to wrap up at this point. Um, I want to thank, uh, first off, uh, Julie Thompson for joining us today. Um, you know, having, having someone here who can give us the, the medical stuff, I think is super important. Um, I want to thank Noah for uh, facilitating our chat. Um, and I also want to thank everyone who is joining us live and who is uh, watching this later on. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, I'm excited to be able to have different ways of connecting with folks. And um, I think that this is going to be uh, going to be something that that's great. Um, uh, oh, and then also uh, thank everyone who submitted questions. Um, if you have something that you would like us to discuss in the future, um, we are uh, somewhat theming our questions, but are happy to take anything as it comes up. Um, please feel free to always send us an email um, with the, uh, the subject as trans health Q&A so that we know that it's not an urgent or question that you're looking to have answered just via email um, so that we can uh, answer at an upcoming Q&A. Julie, is there anything else that you want to add? Nope, just stay tuned. Uh, well, I guess so, yes. Uh, just stay tuned for, for the next one. Um, you know, we'll be posting and, and advertising for when we'll do this again and what the topic will be. Yeah, yeah, um, but it should, uh, we're, we're planning for a regular schedule uh, Wednesday, uh, the first Wednesday of every month from 12 to one. Um, it should be on our um, Fenway Health's Facebook um, and that kind of stuff. And we'll also have it posted on our website, uh, fenwayhealth.org slash transhealth. Um, great, all right, uh, with that, I think we are going to end from here. Um, thank you again to everyone who joined and I uh, look forward to uh, continuing these conversations. Bye-bye. Thank you.